Good morning, everyone. I am here with Kali Bronson. She's the Bernalillo County Stormwater Program Compliance Manager. Thanks for being here with me this morning. Thanks for having me, Laura. I'm looking forward to this conversation. So just to update everyone, there was news late last night. Um, thanks to Jessica Dyer at the Albuquerque Journal for staying up late and covering the city council meeting. Um, so last night, the Albuquerque City Council overrode Mayor Tim Keller's veto of the council's earlier overturn of the clean and green retail ordinance. So what that means in a nutshell is that the city's plastic bag ban is, is dead now um you know which is kind of weird seeing as how so many other cities across the united states have been moving forward with their bans um but you know it also might make a little bit of sense as the fossil fuel industry is really pushing hard to find new uses for their products so we're going to have some we're going to have some coverage coming up in the coming weeks and months looking more specifically at plastics and the fossil fuel industry but this morning we're here to talk about plastics and plastic bags that end up in our city's waterways. So Kali, thanks for being here. Can you talk a little bit first about your job and your department and what you do? Yeah, um, thanks, Laura. Yeah, I work for Bernalillo County. I am, as you said, the Stormwater Program Compliance Manager. And my job essentially is to oversee uh, compliance with an uh, Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, permit that protects stormwater quality. So it's through the NPDES program or non-point discharge elimination system, all those good big acronyms. Um, and we have a bit of a unique permit here in the middle Rio Grande. It's watershed based rather than by jurisdictional boundaries. And it encourages cooperation between the entities that are covered under this permit. So there are lots of areas where Bernalillo County works with other entities like the city of Albuquerque, AMACA, the Flood Control Authority, um, and several others. And we work together and cooperate to um, to meet permit to meet these permit um, requirements. Uh, one of the requirements I think that in that that applies specifically to this conversation we're having today um, is what they call a floatables uh, requirement. And floatables are you know trash, so it's your plastic bags, your cups, your food waste materials, um, and other debris. And the permit wants to, they essentially first want us to have a control program that controls sources of it. So source control, keeping it out of the stormwater first is obviously the easiest way to keep it clean. Um, and then secondarily, uh, structural controls to address what does get into the stormwater. Um, and so that, that um, particular permit requirement, I think is applicable to this, um, to this discussion and this issue. So that photo behind you, can you yes. describe what we're seeing there? So that is a stormwater outfall. Um, I believe this one belongs to the city of Albuquerque, um, but the way the stormwater systems work in, in our area, like in the greater Albuquerque metro area, we have a lot of interconnected there are places that are unincorporated Bernalillo County, uh, places that are city of Albuquerque, places that have not the flood control authority, you know, belongs to them and they all interlink and so that we go in you know it goes Bernalillo County goes into the city then goes into a map then goes into the county and goes back out right so so even though this particular it is it's very complicated the systems are all tangled up together so this particular um outfall belongs to the city but it it likely has inputs from lots of different entities that are covered under this permit um, and so this outfall goes directly to the Rio Grande. And what you are seeing is there's, there's a bit of a screen on there and it's caught some of the plastic bags. And there are, and I'll duck out here, you can, there, there are a lot of plastic bags hanging on there and plastic bags um, tend to be one of the biggest um, contributors to plastics pollutions along with cups, polystyrene, um, you know, packaging, all sorts of plastics that we have in our, in our, uh, stream of waste. So a couple of weeks ago, the Water Protection Advisory Board wrote to Albuquerque officials urging the city council to um, reconsider its earlier repeal of the ordinance. And in that letter, they wrote that the city collects annually, or annually the city collects and disposes of about 
five semi truckloads of plastic bags from drains and they wrote that that doesn't include the plastic bags that are collected from drains by by other entities is that an accurate picture of of the scale of this waste yeah so we um all of the entities that have stormwater systems uh we we clean them out we have to collect this waste and we all track it as part of uh regulations under this permit and and that's pretty accurate you know, a large portion of the material that's collected is sediment and other things like that. But, you know, plastics are, are a big part of that debris, the trash portion of it. Um, so plastic bags, cups, water bottles, um, packaging, all of that is, is there. And then it breaks down. And so even though a large portion of that is sediments, you may have a lot of uh, what we call microplastics in there because those plastics break down over time um, and when they're exposed to sunlight and and become smaller pieces. Um, so that, that becomes part of that um, waste stream as well that gets into that gets into our rivers. Yeah, can you talk about that a little bit more? You know, we see, you know, the like the visual behind you is very obvious. Um, we see plastic bags stuck to cactus and fences and all over the place. But what about those, what about those bits that we can't necessarily see? What's the problem with those? So those plastics, so when plastics start breaking down, they also they leak out toxins in there. There are various types of toxins. It depends on the type of plastic. There are lots of different chemicals, um, but we know that a lot of them uh, really impact human and um, wildlife health, and they're linked to, um, you know, cancers and endocrine disruptors and hormonal disruptions and all, you know, there's all sorts of things that we've linked, we've linked these toxins and plastics to, and so that gets into the water. Um, it gets in when it becomes smaller pieces. Animals can easily eat it. Um, the real big problem with that, obviously there's some toxins in there, but also those, their bodies, we can't digest plastic. So what ends up happening is those plastics just get lodged in their digestive system um, and they're stuck in there. Yeah. And so if you've got a lot of microplastics and it's, you know, floating around in the water, it becomes part of, you know, what they eat, you know, unintentionally. And that can be a really big problem too. And then again, those microplastics, can, it takes, you know, 10 to, I don't know, um, 100 years to decompose, but it never, plastics don't completely decompose ever. So you constantly have this, essentially this source um, within our waters when it gets in there. So I'm, I feel like our, our city's plastic bag ban was complicated because it was passed in 2019, but then it was kind of pulled back because of the, the pandemic and just so much uncertainty at the beginning of the pandemic in particular. But do you have a sense of how something like the city's plastic bag ban can reduce this waste stream that you're having to deal with? Yeah, I think you can look. There are studies that have been done in other cities that have had plastic bag bans. And so, for example, the city of San Jose saw a reduction in plastic bag um, litter from what had been 12% of, of their floatables or their, their trash debris um, in 2010 to 4% in 2012, just from having that plastic bag ban. Um, and that's, that's considerable. Um, and we're seeing that in other, we're seeing that in other um, places. Bay Area has done a lot of studies. You can look at those. But a lot of the places that, that are, um, that have these bans, we do see a, 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 you know, significant reduction in plastic waste. Um, and plastic bags are transported more easily as well because not just, they, they can go through the wind. Like you said, we see them in trees, we see them stuck on cactus. So they get blown around, they get into our waterways, even if they don't get trapped in our stormwater system. Um, they, they move, they move a lot. So um, in that letter that I mentioned earlier, the, the, um, the advisory board also, you know, mentioned that because of this, this waste, it could prevent the city from complying with federal clean water standards. You know, what happens if Albuquerque or, you know, in the state or what happens if we don't comply with those federal clean water standards? Right. So if we don't comply, if the EPA um, assesses our efforts in complying with this permit and they find them to um, not be sufficient or adequate, uh, they can fine us. And those fines can be, um, yeah, I don't remember off the top of my head, but it can be um, tens of thousands of dollars a day until, um, until the entity comes into compliance. So there's significant fines. Um, 
that can really impact uh, that can really impact um, financial viability of these programs. So rather than spending money on fines, we could be spending money on solutions. Yeah, it's just been so interesting to watch this whole debate play out over plastic bags. Um, in some, in, uh, with, with respect to some of the, the anti-plastic bag ban people, they've framed it in terms of, you know, consumers should have the freedom to choose that this is an issue of personal freedoms. Um, but I can't help but feel like um, there's all these, you know, forgive the, the play on words here, but all these downstream impacts that, that are really um, pretty remarkable and potentially expensive. Um, do you have any sense of without a plastic bag ban in place, what some of the other solutions might be? Because people can make their individual choices, but clearly there needs to be um, there needs to be government incentives or government action and system-wide change. I know that isn't your, your job, um, but I'm curious, you know, what you think can be done. Yeah, in, I think that's interesting. So in terms of, you know, that perspective, you know, going back again to my job and making sure that the county is in compliance with this stormwater, this permit to protect stormwater quality, um, as I said, it's a watershed based permit. So we're looking at rather than jurisdictional lines, every time we go in and out of the city or the other flood control authorities, um, we're approaching this as a bigger system, right? We're looking at it systematically rather than cut into pieces. Um, and so, and I think that the same thing can be said for this, you know, the plastic bag ban, the county has one, so within unincorporated county areas, we, we do have a plastic bag ban. Um, it's really helpful to have that, um, you know, watershed wide so that we can reduce it. There are other, you know, issues that, that we do have to look at. You know, it's obviously not going to solve everything to have a plastic bag ban. Um, there are lots of other waste streams, like I said, water bottles and, you know, polystyrene and, you know, plastic containers like all, you know, everything we get, we buy in the stores these days are covered in plastic. So those plastics are in lots of other things. Um, and then, you know, we've got the homeless population, which when you get encampments can really impact, you know, the, these people are trying to figure out how to get by, but they end up leaving a lot of detritus, a lot of debris um, that gets in the stormwater system. So, you know, larger systematic um, solutions need to be looked at as well. Um, impact, you know, impacting homelessness, trying to reduce that, trying to help that, that will in turn impact stormwater quality um, because that does have um, an outsized impact, I think, on it. Um, and then, you know, that a lot of these entities, as I said, the, the floatables control program, um, they want us to first focus on source controls, but they also look at structural control. So there are things that we can put into place. So example, these bars do catch those plastic bags, at least some of them, that certainly doesn't catch all of them. And we have um, what, what are called trash racks in some of our uh, storm sewer systems that help collect those materials, but then that costs us, you know, you have to have crews that go out and maintain it. And if you're getting a lot of it, it takes more care, more maintenance, more work. Um, so people may choose to use or not use plastic bags but the cost of all of this trash, is, it really comes out um, in what we pay, you know, our governmental agencies in those taxes to keep this clean and to, to keep them in um, compliance with these permits for the clean water. It can seem, the whole issue of plastic bags can seem so straightforward, like just a, a choice you make at the grocery store, but thank you so much for helping us understand the, the bigger implications and kind of, um, you know, the, the system-wide um, impacts and consequences. It's really helpful. It's helpful for me to think, you know, kind of more watershed-based and even like you mentioned about homeless encampments. Um, that is something that I've heard counselor bring up that, um, you know, people who are unhoused need the convenience of plastic bags. And while that might be true, I think that you're, you know, what you said is a reminder that we have 
these sort of bigger issues that we need to address um, and to hopefully, you know, make things better moving forward for, for the environment and for people as well. So um, Kali, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, I really appreciate this conversation and um, the whole issue of stormwater is so interesting and hopefully we can talk again about um, some of the some of the other issues involving stormwater in the city as well. Thank you, Laura. It was a pleasure to be here. Thanks.